that music. <laughs> For a minute at a time With John and Will And I guess you just rhyme It's Bad Minute Hello and welcome to another week of Bat Minute Forever The podcast where we've never watched a minute of Batman before even though we really blatantly have. Uh, I am one of, the, one of the hosts, Niall McGowan. And I am your other host, up there with the classics where I belong, John Parker. <laughs> Put it right next to Mark Maron. That's, that's where the show belongs. <laughs> People have called me the second coming of, uh, of Mark Maron. Yes. Least, <laughs> not even dead yet. But you, you are already his second coming. <laughs> I'm, exactly, exactly. It's a bit like the Dalai Lama. Mm. You know, you have to identify the next Mark Maron before he goes. <laughs> uh, and uh, today we're joined, as usual, by some guests. Uh, we have all the way from the, the dusty plains of Down Under, uh, all the way from Mad Max Minutes, we have uh, Julia and Rick Ingham. Hello, thank you so much for having us. Good day, mates. Hey. Thank you for having us. <laughs> <laughs> It, that that had to happen. I love it whenever Mel's trying to do any other accent because <laughs> he can't stop that Aussie from coming in. <laughs> it's 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 rough because it was burned into him at such an early age. <laughs> Although again, this week you're going to be dealing with the same the same deal with the one of the main actresses of this movie. Although I think she probably does she does a pretty good job with accents. I, I feel yeah, she does slip occasionally though, and you really hear the Australian come through. And you're like, oh whoa, that was distracting. Blimey, Batman! <laughs> <laughs> I want to write Roger in from you. I do. <laughs> and now she's gone Cockney now. I don't know what the hell happened there. <laughs> Oh, you, 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 we're uh, globe trotters here on Batman. <laughs> uh, and today we're here to specifically talk about a minute that doesn't actually fe- feature Nicole Kidman, uh, except for like a split second at the very end. Uh, but today we're here to talk about minute eighty-two, which is a minute which opens with an incredulous Dick, uh, and it ends a minute later with uh, a lady lying in wait. So yeah, we're continuing on the little uh, little spat that Dick and Bruce have been having here since uh, since the last week. I love that we can get in all these dick puns because we're not actually being on PG. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you'll know when it's an insult to dick because I'll have added a beep. But <laughs> if it doesn't have a, a beep on it, that means it was just referring to his name the whole time. Yep, yep. But uh, yeah, as you say, they're mid stare down, like we saw in the last minute. Mm. And uh, he wants Al to hang his crappy Robin costume up next to the bat suit mm. where it belongs. Now... I like the sentiment there. You know, I like that kid. But that thing next to Bruce's work of art, no, no, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's a pretty... Considering this kid is supposed to be like a surly teenager who listens to The Offspring in the 90s, <laughs> you think yeah. he would know that this outfit is lame. <laughs> but he doesn't. He seems to be completely blanking on the fact that, like, yeah, you don't look anywhere near as cool as Batman, kid. You look like an <laughs> asshole. Gosh. I'm... Go for it, Julia. It's an odd power move that mm. he commands Al to do this thing that makes him an equal to Batman with this mm. crappy outfit. Oh my gosh. This is... <laughs> yeah, it's a strange thing. This is like, they're in a new relationship, they've moved into each other, and now... Or not moved in to each other, moved in with each other. Thank you. Sorry, a little bit of a Freudian slip there with uh, the history of <laughs> Batman and Robin. But anyway, uh, yeah... Dick is starting to move in on Bruce's territory, and he's even taking over his closet space. Mm. Yeah. That is only fair. If you're going to invite somebody into your home to stay, you have to afford them proper closet space. It's only respectful. Well, I mean, it's a <laughs> huge step as far as the intimacy level of the relationship goes. Like, it's one thing to have someone over a few nights a week or something like that, but to actually give them closet space. It's official. Yeah. (laughs) 
I think it looks that thing. It doesn't even look like it needs hanging up, though. It's more like, I'll give you a drawer. Like a drawer <laughs> way at the bottom. Like I'll let you other... throw this in a, in a pile in the corner. <laughs> yeah, this is cloth. This is not injection molded plastic. <laughs> yeah, and it's like lycra, is it? It's very, very, very tight, at least. Mm. So that's not going to crease easily. Do you need to hang that up? Oh, my up? gosh. Br- Bruce's power move here should have been like, oh, let me see that. And then him going over, like, I know just the place for this. Go over to one of the big chasms in the cave and just throw it in. <laughs> like, what are you going to do, kid? <laughs> it's exactly where it belongs. <laughs> and the movie knows that because the way it uh, just abandons it as fast as possible. Mm. Then. I do have some questions about uh, Bruce's own attire here, though, because in this scene, he is wearing his uh, Ben Solo cosplay, where it's like his, you know, he's got the Last Jedi look of like the bare chest, but like the the trousers up to like near his nipples, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a sexy look. It's a sexy look. People loved it on Ben Solo, and it's working here. But it sort of indicates that the, you know, the, the way the bat suit works, because it seems like he's still wearing the trousers, but then he's got like a little bit of cloth that goes a bit further up. So presumably the suit is like a two-piece, so he puts on a top of rubber, yeah. but he always has a full body stocking underneath. So he'll put on then like the rubber trousers, rubber top, and then underneath he has a like a onesie, basically. And then to Alfred yeah. to tend to his wounds, basically he's taken off the top, and then he's had to roll down the onesie and kind of fold it over his trousers a little bit, I guess is what is what we're being presented with here. Now, I'm guessing that's the case, but I love that you put that much thought into it. <laughs> that all makes so much sense. I don't know if he's really yeah. rolled down like a lycra suit, as if he's like wearing one of those morph suits they use on like the set oh. of Space Jam or something like that, because I'm looking <laughs> at the amount of fabric that's kind of gathered around his waist, and it almost looks like he's not wearing a onesie underneath all the bat suit. It's almost like he's just wearing really high waisted tights and he's just rolled down the top of the tights. Like he's wearing shapewear. Yeah. I was going to say, gentlemen, gentlemen, <laughs> let me explain to you the world of shapewear. <laughs> there are many different styles. It appears the one that he is wearing is the kind that is basically just a tube that runs up your torso. It may or may oh, not yeah. come over your breasts he doesn't need that kind of support so it probably doesn't it probably comes up to like the top of his or like the mid rib cage mm. i have one of those for my catwoman costume when at uh, halloween exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> and uh it's it's very full on it's got metal bars oh in my it God. and it like left loads of imprints <laughs> on my body for like a week <laughs> let's see how can we make shapewear less comfortable let's put metal bars in it did the job. I, I really want to believe that Batman has two separate halves for his costume, the top and the bottom, just for, mm. I guess, ease of access would be a polite no way of saying it. I'm saying, like, obviously, Batman is used to disappearing and going to do Batman business at the drop of a hat. It would be nice to be able to think that the man underneath the costume would be able to do his own personal quote unquote business at the drop of a hat in the same <laughs> manner. I don't want Batman having to hold it in, I guess is mm. what I'm saying. Okay, well I have two plausible alternatives. Okay. <laughs> uh you've heard about the Navy SEALs who when they when they train, they pee in their suits to keep themselves warm. Oh. Yep. Okay, Ooh. so that's number one. Number two is a catheter system. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. Maybe like an astronaut. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Alfred is extremely capable. I'm sure he could put in a catheter. But still, it's the number two situation that I'm worried about. Well, <laughs> that's much more controllable. Like, if you have a good, healthy diet, then you're on a schedule. And if you needed to adjust that schedule, you could. Hmm. That just means I just feel bad though the fact that Alfred every night he's just like this is my life <laughs> just like having to <laughs> insert the tube and, yep, and then at the end of, at the end of the night he has to go out and he's like all right time to empty, empty out the bag into the chasm <laughs> <laughs> yeah he just throws it over the edge yes, I would that's why the back cave is a chasm I would such prefer a catheter system rather than Bruce just doing the Navy Seal method because then he's trying to sneak along rooftops and all over here is squelch 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 <laughs> oh. Or does he maybe have a? Um, I was gonna. I was gonna say the English phrase there. A diaper. Does he maybe have one of those? I was gonna say a, a nappy, nappy, but then I'd be like, our listeners are all Americans. <laughs> 
he he really really might Mm. He, he genuinely might do would that afford the right flexibility for combat we need to test this well thing, if you yeah. believe the commercials on tv for adult diapers <laughs> then yes <laughs> oh my god that's the thing though because that would that would make him uh sort of impervious then to fearsome situations because if you see something that, that would normally terrify somebody <laughs> Batman can just let it go and appear like he's really brave. Because he's just like, oh, no. he's not having to hold anything back. He's like, no, I'm letting it all go. And now everyone yeah. think I'm a real badass because oh. it looked as if I didn't react all that much, even though I know inside the suit, <laughs> it's friggin' anarchy he can in here right now. funnel his fear. That must frustrate yeah. Scarecrow to no end. He does something <laughs> terrifying, something that is pants-weddingly <laughs> scary, and Batman just stands there not flinching because he's <sighs> already evacuated. <laughs> <laughs> and Scarecrow's like, Batman, you are brave and bold. <laughs> it, there's one thing, though, that uh, perplexed me with this this scene. Because uh, it was something I was waiting to get to. It's like, all right, I'll have to see if this thing pops up. Because have you guys, have you all seen the film Heat with uh, Robert De Niro and Al Pacino? Oh, no. Ages ago. I have not. It's a it's a major gap in my movie viewing experience. <laughs> to be fair, it's a very long film as well, so I don't I don't. There's no shame if you're just like, oh, the hell with that, because Jesus Christ, it's like over three hours long. Oh. But one big thing in it that I took away when I saw it, like when I was a you know not a kid, but when I was like a teenager, is that there's a scene where Val Kilmer's talking to De Niro and he's wearing a T-shirt, and you see this bizarre growth on Val Kilmer's elbow. I've actually got a picture of it, because I was just like, I have to show this to people so you know what I'm talking about. But, like, you know, it's one of those things, like, that's just Val Kilmer's body. He's got, like, a weird thing on his uh, his elbow. Um, it's a really, like... Uh, let's see, I'll get, the, so I'll get it up in the Skype chat here. Apparently, it is just part of his body. Like, uh, you see, it's <laughs> in there now. But apparently, yeah, during... When he was filming Ooh. The Doors... It's like a saggy he weenus. Was, yeah, it, it, it kind of seems like it's like a big cyst or something. But apparently it was when he was filming The Doors, he was supposed to do a stage dive. And one of the stuntmen oh. didn't catch him, so he fell, broke his arm. And since then, apparently Val Kilmer just has this on his elbow. And he filmed Batman Forever concurrently with Heat. Like, there was back-to-back shooting. So how come you, you can't see this in this scene? No, I, I, I've just gone frame by frame, and I can't see it. It's clever shot editing and angles. Proper angles. You never see that left elbow. Yeah, yeah. I just wonder if like Joel Schumacher is like, well, I guess we'd have to put like, an extra bit of rubber in the elbow for the protrude out of Batman's suit so like, he, has, he has room for it and stuff. And It's just odd that, like, yeah, I was really keeping an eye on it. I was like, I wonder if they're going to show you the, the weird bump in his elbow. But tragically... <laughs> show us the weird elbow. <laughs> you don't want to like, in such a serious scene. You don't want the entire audience going, like, what the hell is up with that elbow? <laughs> I actually would like it for the character, though, because it would show Bruce, you know, he's broken bones. He's got battered and bruised and bent out of shape. They should be theoretically doing all that stuff you see in Dark Knight Rises later on, where he's just like, yeah, covered in from scar tissue and just like slashes yeah. everywhere. And so it's like, yeah, this guy's been, he's been through some stuff. And that elbow would add to that. Like, he could even be yeah. like, oh, you, you don't want to become me, dick. Like, look at my elbow. Look what happened to me. <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> you'd think someone like him as well with the money he had especially at the time you could fix that right maybe you just didn't want to yeah, yeah. this is a reminder of uh like he keeps each scar cause, and, and each sort of thing that happens to him is like as a reminder to never do that again or something so like this yeah, is when yeah. <laughs> i don't know the penguin hit me with an extra like a, an umbrella that turned into a sledgehammer or something <laughs> <And> then... <laughs> But of course, then we get the little bit of back and forth between Alfred and Bruce here, because Dick swaggers off, kind of, you know, con- content that he's won this argument. Uh, and then Bruce says to Alfred, like, oh, and you're encouraging him. And Alfred responds with, you know, oh, young men with a mind for revenge don't need encouragement. They need guidance. And considering the situation Bruce Wayne is in currently, it's like, were you the best person to give that guidance, Alfred? Because... <laughs> Now you got a guy who's doing the work of an insane person and who was like reaching fever pitch in terms of his identity crisis within this mm-hmm. film. <laughs> like he just doesn't know who he's supposed to be anymore. And I'm on Bruce's side. Like Alfred is encouraging him. Yeah. And, you know, 
I get what he's saying, but <laughs> tying back into this show again, second time in two minutes, it's taken the Dexter's dad approach. He's decided that Dick can't be dissuaded. So, well, we might as well help him. It's, it's like Alfred can't help himself. He sees a young man in pain and he's like, you know what you should do is you should dress up in a costume and go punch people in the streets. That'll make you feel better. <laughs> That's what my therapist taught me to do. Yeah, <laughs> And it's almost like young men in mind for revenge need a little encouragement. They need guidance. Whereas Alfred's like threatening Bruce be like, I've done it once. I'll do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take every orphan, orphan in this city and I'll turn them all into vigilantes. Just try and stop me. <laughs> oh, that would be a great twist. That'd be a good story, com like a comic book story. <laughs> it does actually seem, though, that like Alfred is grooming a replacement Bruce, particularly in this minute, because at the end, like mere seconds from now, when Bruce is talking about like, oh, you know, the, the curse of being Batman. And then he's Alfred's trying to fix him up with Chase Meridian. He's like, oh, go to her. Let the lady decide. And all this stuff. <laughs> As if he's like, oh, you quipping Batman. I already got this other kid. I'll train him up. Don't you worry. Like, <laughs> yes, I'll, oh. I'll fix the costume. Don't worry about that. But like, he's Palpatine. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Take Bruce Wayne's place at my side. <laughs> it's like one of those curses that you can only save yourself by passing the curse on to somebody else. So mm, Alfred is trying yes. to save Bruce by passing the curse on to Dick. <laughs> Screw this kid. We've only just met him. We don't care about him. He can take the curse. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let's imagine the scene now, though, of Alfred sitting in the, a throne in the Batcave and with Dick Grayson's <laughs> lame costume next to him, like rubbing it, going, you want this, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> It. <laughs> we need we need this version of alfred in a comic <laughs> <laughs> that's the weird thing though in terms of um you know th at this point we still have like dick's not officially robin just yet like it's he's getting there mm -hmm. but he's still got a ways to go but weirdly enough in the the bachelor draft the the first draft of this film uh, which usually I've sort of lauded for being like, oh, it's got a lot of more material here. They had a lot more cool ideas and stuff. They go down a kind of a really bad route with it, where uh, at this point, Dick just is Robin. And what oh. actually happens is after he's hauled Batman out of the wreckage, they have a minor spat, which basically says, um, Batman says to him, oh, well, why were you following me in the first place? Dick says, I told you, I want to be your partner. I want to help you. And then Batman says, and who are you supposed to be? Robin Hood? What, with those colors? Great camouflage and a paint factory, maybe. Uh, Dick says, like, oh, you got a real gratitude problem here, Bruce. You know that? And then Batman says, oh, Batman. In public, you call me Batman. And Dick says, oh, you need to chill. I tracked you. I kicked some ass to help you get out of there. I didn't cause any problems. I know you're a solo act, but... And then suddenly, the police swarm around them. Gordon gets out and says... So who's the boy wonder, Batman? And then they say a beat. Then Dick slash Robin chimes in. I'm his new partner. And the reporters who are also there <laughs> uh, say like, oh, who are you? What's your name? And then Batman just says Robin. And that's it. That's how they become Batman and Robin. Oh the next God. scene is them. It says like, what cuts the main, wa main, not main wanner, Wayne Manor, <laughs> uh, Jim, Day, Dick, Bruce and Dick work out strenuously. Then it cuts to the pool where they they swim vigorously, and then there's like a montage of them training together. And like Bruce is showing them how to use a like a remote control batarang, and the uh, like at one point he it, it fires out a rope that ties up Dick, and he's all like, "Hey, what are you doing?" And they're both laughing away. And then Dick <laughs> takes it and he accidentally crashes through a window of Wayne Manor and stuff, and they're laughing at that. And it's just a montage of these two guys been best buds all of a sudden. And now they're totally partners. And it's like, that is awful. <laughs> like, I much prefer the whole, like, all right, so drips and drabs. And then when Bruce's back is against the wall, at the end, he's like, I concur to accepting that a man has got to go in his own way. And, hey, I'm going to take you on as my partner and stuff. Yeah, that montage you were talking about, it sounded a little too much like Rocky Three. <laughs> like, if Bruce and Dick were oh, running wow. along the beach having a foot race, and then at the end they were like... Jumping up and down, holding each other in their arms. You know, that, I don't know. It wouldn't jive. Yeah, it really does sound like that. You know, talking about them out, out on the polo fields together and things like this. <laughs> it's, it's really like, it, it's very 1960s Batman. I'll give them that, that that's what they're harking back to. But it's really like, nah, I think, uh, I think Akiva Goldsman and, and Schumacher 
sort of they saw the writing on the wall there in terms of like you know, just get rid of that <laughs> you know, I mean, the- yeah and as as much as this movie harks back to the 60s that wouldn't even fit this mm. to, yeah that would be totally out i tell you what that conversation about who are you going to be robin hood uh that could have been a Batman and Robin, the movie style callback to another DC property. Be like, oh, who are you going to be? Robin Hood? I'm pretty sure there's a guy in whatever city Green Arrow hangs out in that has that shtick already. Yeah, and he's basically Batman anyway, Green Arrow. That could have been. Maybe now they're like, hey, we already had the Metropolis mention here. Like, we don't want (laughs) to, we don't want to blow these nerds' wads here uh, (laughs) when they go to see this movie. I don't get the next line from Alfred, right? Because he says to Bruce, you above all should understand the consequences of the life you choose. Because I'm sat here thinking, well, yeah, that's the point. He knows all too well. He wants to stop it happening yeah. again. What are you saying? 100% correct. Yeah. It's- <laughs> yeah. Look, Alfred really is a man. He he's at more cross purposes than Bruce Wayne here. <laughs> like, oh, well, I want you to stop, but I want this orphan to be your partner. Uh, I'm encouraging him, but I'm also saying that, well, you know why he shouldn't be you. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't make a lick of sense. Like, it's not just me misreading the script, right? No, no. This... Like, I, I'm not missing something obvious. Well, if we want to go with if we want to go with puppeteer Alfred, it could just be that he's setting up Bruce to be like, Bruce, you need to be my rival in this situation. I'm going to push him one way. I need you to be the opposite force. Oh. You know, he's... Maybe then you'll get the real answer out of him, what he yeah, wants. building up his own rival. Oh. I like it. <laughs> I don't know. It's the only thing that makes any damn sense anyway. That's the thing, because then the... The rest of the scene sort of plays out in a certain way, uh, a quite quite succinct, very brief manner, where the you know the conversation turns to Doctor Chase Meridian, because uh, Bruce he sits down, turns on his dual TVs that he has, <laughs> uh, Ooh, and for fancy. some reason there's <laughs> for some reason there's a 1995 GIF of a Chase Meridian playing that he got from. Somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> I'm so happy you said that. My note says, why is he creepily staring at some weird gif he's made? Because <laughs> like, this really seems like footage that's, like, it's her getting ready for a TV interview. But this wouldn't be stuff that aired. This would be like, this is her just before the camera said go. And somehow mm-hmm. Bruce has hacked into, like, the GNN network <laughs> and <had> stolen this <laughs> footage of Chase Marie. That's kind of creepy. That's not romantic. You guys mentioned earlier that there was a deleted scene where Dr. Chase Meridian was on a talk show defending yes, Batman. Yes. Mm-hmm. This mm-hmm. kind of feels like a talking head angle for something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm, totally. Well, that's the thing. Now you bring that up, uh, Rick. Of course, um, there is, in fact, a deleted scene along those lines that's supposed to come right here uh, in this exact moment of the minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's one of those things too, where it's like talking about the bastard draft, and they cut out a thing that was, you know, terrible. Where like, you know, Bruce and Robin just becoming best buds in the, the, the blink of an eye because of the press have put, you know, <laughs> have just kind of made it so. Uh, but yeah, there was a much, much better version of the scene, in my opinion, anyway, that the the played out now because all that stuff that was in earlier drafts of the script with Vondell Millions, the kind of Montel. Uh, the stand-in that the, they had for Gotham there was supposed to come now with a scene that they've shot and you can get on YouTube and whatnot uh, where Bruce watches someone called Kenneth Frequency uh, who delivers a, a, a scathing diatribe about Batman. Uh, is that meant to be like Max Headroom or something? Well, I think at, at that point, actually, what that will be in reference to is uh, in the early 90s, that was like a cultural meme, I think, was... Uh, Basically, famous news anchor Dan Rather uh, was walking home one day, and he was attacked by two random men. Uh, and the men, one of them guys was beating him up, and the other guy kept saying, Kenneth, what's the frequency? And uh, uh, apparently then, like, uh, these guys disappeared. It was a mystery for a long, long time. So when they made this, that was kind of a thing that everyone knew about, because R.E.M., the year before, had released the song, you know, What's the Frequency, Kenneth, which was a reference to that. You get mention of it in uh, Daniel Klaus' 
you know, the guy who wrote Ghost World, he did another book called uh, A Velvet Glove Wrapped in Iron that mentions what's the frequency kind of and stuff. Uh, and I think it was just a thing that people knew about because it was like this weird mystery, like a well-known celebrity was attacked by a random guy and he kept asking him this question that seemed to mean nothing. Uh, and apparently it was only in, it was in, only in 1997 when a stagehand at uh, NBC was murdered like on, on site by someone trying to break in, a guy called William Tagger. Uh, who believed the TV signals were being beamed directly into his brain. Uh, and he was oh trying God. to break into NBC to, to find out what the frequency was so he could stop it. He was identified as that guy. So I guess Dan Rather ah. probably like, whew, that was a close call for me because he, he, he actively ended up killing somebody. Yeah. So uh, so that's why he wanted the frequency. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. And mm. uh, I guess so, so when I first seeing Kenneth Frequency, what's the frequency Kenneth from R.E.M. came to my mind. And I was like, I guess, is it Joel Schumacher an R.E.M. fan? And then looking more into it, it's like, no, I guess it would have just been a thing that everyone would have known about. And this guy, the character, Kenneth Frequency, being a news anchor, would of course be this little call to Dan Rather, who was in the same kind of thing, basically. But uh, but yeah, within the, the that deleted scene, Kenneth Frequency comes out with a whole thing about like, oh, every outlaw from Toledo to Timbuktu has come to town to do battle with that Batman. And whole big <laughs> thing about like, it's only John and Jane Q taxpayer that have to foot the bill for this vigilante and all this kind of malarkey. Uh, and basically comes out with all the stuff that Vondell Millions was sort of talking about earlier. Uh, well, Vondell Millions and a guy called Dr. Ames, I believe. Uh, in the Bachelor draft, where the, I think it was like, actually in the Goldsman draft as well. I think they, they crossed over. Uh, and then basically saying, Batman should put the Batmobile up on blocks and a word, retire, and all this stuff. And then Bruce is like, oh, well, they want me to retire, Alfred. And goes into a whole scene then where he kind of has like a little little crisis about what he's doing and whatnot. And the, the main problem I have with them deleting the scene is because it's some of the best acting that Val Kilmer does throughout the whole movie, in my opinion. Yeah, but any chance for him to express, like, character and things like that, they, they cut it, we've noticed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it all ties into that Red Book edition and whatnot, but, like, he has a whole little back and forth with Alfred, which is really, I, th- I thought was really good, where, like... He's sort of wondering why he even became Batman in the first place. And he's remembering back because he's having the, you know, as he throughout the movie, he's having the repressed memories coming back up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he says, like, he remembers falling into the cave and seeing the bat and stuff. And he's like, is that all this is? A little boy scared by a monster in the dark. Uh, you know, maybe that's why I became Batman, not, not to cry, fight crime, but to fight that fear of that monster. And Alfred's like, well, maybe that's, you know, you became the fear after that. And then Bruce is like, well, in that case, then Batman is my enemy and all this kind of stuff. And that's the kind of thing that's been used by comic book writers. Very interesting work. Like Darwin Cook did Batman Ego, wherein Batman and Bruce Wayne kind of split into separate entities at one point. And like Batman is this ominous monster that's haunting Bruce Wayne's mind and all this kind of thing. And it's like, yeah, it's a really interesting concept. Uh, I love that. And the the Goldsman draft, actually, I was going to say this later on, but it ties in here. It's got more about that kind of stuff on the page. Sadly, they don't film any of that Mm. because he's got a bit where he's really worried about Dick and he's talking to Alfred about it, saying, you know, it's it's happening again. (laughs) It Um, is happening again. (laughs) Well, yeah. (laughs) And then he sees a newspaper saying, bat more harm than good. And uh, he think he's like, maybe they're right. Jack Napier's dead. My parents are avenged. The Wayne Foundation contributes a small fortune to police and crime prevention programs. Why do I keep doing this? So he's like, well, if I was just Bruce, I'd be doing more good for people. <laughs> that's that dialogue that actually makes it into that deleted scene as well. That the, it's actually yeah, it's yeah. Alfred says that to him, uh, and then. I think it ends with a note where um, Alfred actually hands him an active phone. Like, he's rang Chase Meridian for him. And she's going, like, this is Dr. Meridian. Like, who is this? Who, who's there? Who is this? And then Bruce is like, who am I, Alfred? I don't think I know anymore. And this is all, like, this is interesting well, stuff. Great. Like, it's like, why would you cut that out? But, yeah. Because we... they don't want to think her. They want kids to buy toys and go to McDonald's. <laughs> Besides, we don't need an episode of Crank Yankers starring Val Kilmer as Batman. <laughs> Making crank phone calls to people. <laughs> That'd be great. This is him proving that he's still like a viable option for Gotham. It's like, who else but Batman can stop the crank yanker? 
it was actually him the whole time. <laughs> it's just like it's a one man war on crime where he is both the, the, the crime and the crime fighter. Oh my gosh. That'd be a good twist in a story as well. Yeah, Bruce is is uh, a crime boss behind the scenes so that Batman has people to It's find. like what Alec Baldwin was talking about in Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, which we watched yesterday. Uh, mm. you know, Batman is his fi- is a fire starter and firefighter all in one. Which is actually like Basically. a thing that happens with firefighters is, you know, they get bored sitting around the station. So some of them go a little crazy and start setting fires so they have something to do. It's not it's not oh something God. that's like light to talk about. It's like the actual like problem that plagues people. But it's it's not fake. I'll say that much. Mm. Oh, that's my, I suppose it makes sense, though, because I mean, who will know how to set a fire better than a firefighter? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, because I guess they'll be like, I can set it in such a way where it'll do, like, impressive damage, but not enough that would actually hurt people or something, maybe. Like, I could, it could be easily contained, because at least we'll have something to do. Or Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, that's, 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 that's a... But <laughs> it's weird, though, cause, like, if Batman was at actually starting fires, then you got a real problem. If he's, if he's just prank calling people, then I guess it's like, well, I guess he's kind of annoying, but uh, it's, <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> I actually have a problem as well with uh, what Bruce says next. Mm. Because he says that he's never been in love before. Yes. Oh, my God. What about the last two movies? Oh, what about Selena? That, that irked me to no end. Was I think it was when we, me and you, John, like we didn't watch it together, but separately, before we started recording this season, I believe both of us like, rewatched the movie and were like, what the, what the f*** is this line about? Like, I've never been in love before. <laughs> Jesus Christ, we spent, we spent so much time talking about both Vicky and Selena Kyle, and he was definitely yeah. in love with at least one of them. At least with Selena. The whole movie was about that. At the end of the <laughs> he was he ripped off the mask, he confessed who he was to her and said he was gonna give it all up so they could go and you know be together yeah. and deal with their mutual damage as a couple. Like he was one hundred percent he had much more chemistry with Selena Kyle. Like it was the the couple we all wanted to see. Yeah, and, and that that felt more like in this with Chase. It does feel it's um it's sex, right? At the moment, at least with Selena, it was more. I mean, obviously, it was a very sexual relationship, but it was more psychological as well. There was there was a deep, strange uh, connection there that you couldn't quite explain. They felt a lot more connected. Well, they're both people. They both had split personalities. They, they're like, yeah, like, mm. I, I understand you're a very damaged person who vents everything via a, 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 like an avatar you've created, essentially. And now that, that monster has sort of become the real you rather than the facade and whatnot. But um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Of course, though, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't mention the fact that the, the, the upcoming Catwoman... Of course, of the stars of Mad Max Fury Road there, Mm -hmm. Zoe Kravitz. Yep, Zoe Kravitz, who co-starred in a television show called Big Little Lies alongside Nicole Kidman. Uh, Oh, it's all connected. I mean, like I was watching an episode of um, those hot ones on YouTube that uh, she was doing. Ah, yes, the show with hot questions and even hotter wings. Is that is that's the very one, Rick? (laughs) Oh, it's that. (laughs) I didn't know what I was talking about until you said that. See, she came across very well in it. Like, I was like after, I was like, oh, I think I, I was never fussed about Zoe Kravitz before. And after watching that, I was like, oh, she seems like she's a pretty cool person. But uh, I remember one of the things in it was that apparently after wrapping season two of Big Little Lies, they all took a photo together, the entire cast at a bowling alley with, uh, like, it was Meryl Streep and friggin' everybody was there. And then this went up on Instagram, went viral. And the only person not in the photo was Zoe Kravitz. Uh, and because she went to get a beer or something and she just came like, apparently uh. she was fuming about it so she's put up on her own Instagram like a really crudely photoshopped version where like <laughs> she's just plopped in the middle with a bowling ball in her hand <laughs> oh that's brilliant I love that in fact one of my favourite bands this ties into Batman as well The Damned yeah. uh, on their debut album um, on the back cover I think it is you couldn't see Captain Sensible the bass player at the time because he was turning away from the camera for the shot and he was annoyed. He's like, oh, I wanted to show my mum. Mm. Like, I've got an album out. <laughs> so to to make him happy, they, like, got a little photograph, cut his head out, and just sort of stuck it in the bottom corner, like, look, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, yeah, cool, that works. It's like the 
the episode of The Simpsons where Bart gets lifted for shoplifting. And he's got the family photo where he's getting yanked out by the security guard. And then at the end, he comes <laughs> and just puts the picture, the completely separate picture of him at the, at the side and stuff. <laughs> but I wonder that kind of thing, though. He, Bruce now is saying, I've never been in love before. Even though, like, he's been both previous movies. He had much more chemistry with Vicky Vale in the, the brief yeah. scenes that we saw of them together. And Selena Kyle. There's no chemistry with Chase. The, the only chemistry with Chase is when he's Batman. And then when it's Bruce and Chase together, it's just kind of like, these are two people who are sat next to each other. Yeah, that's like, I don't feel well, the connection between them. That is kind of his point, because Alfred encourages him now. He's the great encourager. And that's what Bruce says. Like, no, she wants Batman. And so far, all the evidence points that way. But at the same time, though, I think she'd quickly change her mind if they did genuinely, like, hook up in that kind of a way. Because you can't have a thing with the bat unless you're a cat. <laughs> <laughs> I only said that because I know you hate them being called oh, bat and cat. Oh, God, but <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a point. You can't, you can't hook up with him. It's like getting with the bad boy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, is this but, just a situation where love is remaining a drug that's the high, not the pill? Yes, yeah. definitely, like it's, it's, definitely. It's there because it's exciting. It's not there because it's healthy. It's It definitely isn't. If Batman, just Batman, not Bruce, had a relationship with Chase, how would that go for either part? <laughs> that's terrible. It's like every night he'd be like landing at like 5 a.m. completely covered in blood and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you could you could sleep together. That works. That's fine. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, Batman can't sleep. He's got to be out on the streets fighting crime. Ah, uh, because crime never <laughs> sleeps. Crime never sleeps. But well, yeah, actually, if he did pop in every now and then just to you know get freaky, <laughs> what 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 time would Batman be in the mood? I don't know. Well, I think it could be during <laughs> Chase Meridian's office hours. He's just like. Yeah. He's a, this is the only time I have available is like when you're working because I'm freaking Batman at night. What, what do you want me to do? Yeah, you'd have to schedule it in, and that's not sexy. Yeah, I do. I, I love Alfred's delivery though um, of a uh, go to her because he's got, <laughs> so it's, it's slightly pervy to me though. <laughs> he just sort of <laughs> sidles up like go to her. Let the lady decide. It's like trust yeah. me, your moldy old eighty year old bachelor <laughs> friend. I know well, the inner workings a... of the the mind of the ladies. <laughs> Alfred is a Sith Lord. No, I can appreciate that Alfred's like, hey, you should go and communicate your relationship things. And then Bruce like, oh, I have an assumption of what her ideas are. And Alfred's like, no, let this woman share with you through open communication what her actual mm -hmm. thoughts and feelings are instead of you just presuming everything. Mm. Yeah, no, actually, that ties into the Goldsman draft as well because a little bit. I didn't want to read the whole damn thing. There's a much bigger scene in the in the draft. Um, Bruce actually says, "Like, uh, if I let go of Batman, I'll lose her." And Alfred says, "Perhaps, perhaps not. Why not ask the lady?" And Bruce is like, "How is Batman knowing she wants me, or is Bruce Wayne and hope?" <laughs> But yeah, so he's like, go go and actually speak to her. Ask her what she wants. I love of the reason Alfred was getting into all this kind of pop psychology stuff was because they have a deleted scene of him sitting reading one of Chase Meridian's books. <laughs> and he's just getting all <laughs> this advice from her. <laughs> <laughs> it would just be great, I guess. So she's basically got all these listicles. And Alfred's like, ooh, like oh, top 10 ways to uh, make your child obey. <laughs> so he's just like... <laughs> 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 but, um... But yeah, because we do have a little brief uh, cut to Chase Marine's apartment, but we're going to be spending the rest of the week there, so uh, I guess mm -hmm. we can leave all that till tomorrow. Um, do you guys, do you have anything else about this minute that you want to bring up at all? Nope, nothing to add. All done. Uh, but um, yeah, so at this time of the week, uh, in the spirit, of course, of Batman Forever, uh, I'd like to pose a riddle to the guests, because the Riddler been in the movie and all that, all that malarkey. Uh, so, uh, are you guys ready and willing to endure having a riddle thrown at you? <laughs> <laughs> For sure, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm included as well. I don't know the riddle. Bring it on. Okay, okay. So, riddle me this. A woman gave birth to two sons, born on the same hour, same day, same year. 
but they were not twins. How could this be? God damn it. You're the worst. <laughs> Same amount. All right. I, I might have an answer. Okay. If that's okay. Oh. I say, are we allowed to speculate on Monday, or do we have to wait until Friday to I speculate? I can wait. Yeah, I can wait to. I'm thinking, yeah, because we used to just have it like, oh, the guests could just shout it out. But I think it, it makes it a little more fun for people throughout the week mm-hmm. to leave until Friday, because then people in the group can speculate and whatnot. So, like, put it, keep it in your, keep it in your pocket for now, Julia. Okay. And, uh, mm-hmm. bring, bring it, bring it out on Friday. All right. And if you get it right, you are exempt from the final challenge of the week. <laughs> oh. So uh, do try and yeah, get it right. Yeah, I'm highly motivated. <laughs> well, we will head off into the dark, dark night. Uh, would both of you like to tell our listeners where they can find you, your show, or anything else online? Certainly. As was mentioned at the top of this episode, Julia and I are the hosts of the Mad Max Minute, going through the Mad Max series of movies one minute at a time. You can find all of our stuff on madmaxminute.com and Mad Max Minute is our tag on pretty much all social media. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you should be able to find us. Check it out. It's one of the top shows and and top series of movies. Mm. Because I like that each film in that franchise is very different. For better or worse with the third one. (laughs) Very different. (laughs) But uh, uh, if you've not seen any of them, people, you're in for a treat. Mm. One isn't like two, two isn't like three, etc., etc. Check them out, then listen to the show. Or listen to the show without watching it. That'd be fascinating. Mm. I want to know what people think. I don't think I've done that. Have I done that with a show? Have I listened I think so, to a most podcast? of the characters in Mad Max are all like baffling names, and this, the descriptions of them would be so bizarre <laughs> to not have <laughs> a, like a face to put the the thing you're describing. We'd be like, how do you describe like Lord Humongous to someone who has never seen <laughs> what it is? Like, it's just... he's a Lord and he's Humongous. <laughs> Yeah. I think get, what more do you need to I know? I guess then when you look at him, you'll be like, I guess that's exactly what I thought he was going to be. Yeah, yeah. He's as bizarre an, an entity <laughs> of a character as you could possibly imagine. You can't really go wrong with him. But uh, yeah, do check that out, everybody. Come and speak to us oh, on Facebook. One th- other oh, thing, yeah. uh, John, I'll do a little plug myself because in researching oh, oh. Val Kilmer's Elbow, I've discovered that it has its own Twitter page. So uh, yeah. apparently on Twitter, you can follow <laughs> Val Kilmer's Elbow. Uh, it currently has 11 followers. So, Oh, uh, I'm going to follow. You've made this page. No. <laughs> those are rookie numbers. you got to pump up those numbers. We will depart. Come and speak to us on Facebook at the Bat Minute Listener's Cave. We're on Twitter at Bat Minute. And come and subscribe to our Patreon for more wonderful content. And to help us, it funds us. It pays the bills. Uh, so that's always lovely. And yeah, you get extras. You get episodes. If you really want, you can get our autographs. <laughs> <laughs> so... You know, it's the top tier because we're so famous and all. But, you know, you can get it. And we'll be back on Wednesday with more Bat Minute Forever. Next time, the knight and the maiden. A bat on a balcony beguiles a bed-based beauty as he promptly responds to her call for booty. But as lips are locked and rubber is rubbed, could our caped crusader be on the cusp of being snubbed? Find out Wednesday, same bat pod, different bat minute. <laughs>